Hello, welcome to the New Stack Makers, a podcast where we talk about at scale application development, deployment, and management. This episode of the New Stack Makers is sponsored by KubaCon plus Cloud Native Con. KubaCon plus Cloud Native Con conferences gather adopters and technologists to further the education and advancement of cloud native computing. The vendor neutral events feature domain experts and key maintainers behind popular projects such as Kubernetes, Prometheus, gRPC, Envoy, and more. The KubaCon Seattle event is coming right up December 10th through 13th. It is sold out. You can still get on the waiting list. Registration will open soon for their 2019 events. Be sure to register early for KubaCon Barcelona, May 20th through 23rd. KubaCon Shanghai, June 24th through 26th, and KubaCon San Diego, November 18th through 21. Hope to see you there. Hey, it's Alex Williams, the new stack here at KubaCon plus Cloud Native Con in Shanghai, China. And joining me for a conversation is David Aronchik, co-founder of the Kubeflow project. How are you, David? Thank you so much for having me. I'm great. Great. Now, let's just get right into the discussion about Kubeflow. For the people who are out there who may not be familiar with Kubeflow, can you explain what it is? Absolutely. So about a year ago, December, KubeCon 2017 in Austin, we looked at the landscape of machine learning and machine learning technology. And we realized that one of the most fundamental things that people were having trouble doing was just the basics of setting up a reliable machine learning platform and pipeline. And we knew that Kubernetes was going to be great at this. It, it had already transformed the industry when it came to so many different types of applications. What we decided was that we were going to build this framework with a set of norms around packaging and deployment and all those kind of things to make rolling out a machine learning pipeline portable and composable. You can pick and choose what you want. And, um, and distribute it to take advantage of the essence of Kubernetes. Uh, we launched it in December of 2017 and it has been on fire. Uh, 4,000 GitHub stars, uh, you know, hundreds of uh, co committers all around the world, 1,900 commits, people like uh, uh, falling all over themselves, well beyond our expectations to really help come together and give machine learning, scientists, uh, machine learning engineers and data scientists very easy ways to roll things out. But what, what was wrong with the way they were doing it? Or what, there's nothing wrong, really, but what is it that was the, the impediment or the, the block that made, that made this you know, flow so significant? A absolutely. One of the biggest things was that essence of portability. A data scientist today will often go and grab their laptop, often very high powered, maybe it has a GPU, something like that, and they'll sit down and they'll, they'll execute a bunch of commands to install a complex machine learning platform for them to experiment with a model. And that's great. But the second they want to bring that model to production or bring it into their enterprise, things get challenging. Their laptop probably doesn't look anything like their ultimate production system. Not as scalable, not as flexible, uh, doesn't have the same you know, uh, uh, identity and security requirements, all those kind of things. And so, uh, they'd often have to go and rewrite the entire thing in order to bring the same data science platform into the enterprise. Uh, and worse than that, um, a lot of times setting up these really complicated distributed systems to do these training things at scale on terabytes, petabytes of data was really challenging. Um, the idea behind Kubeflow is because it describes exactly what you're doing in a way that works on your laptop, and works in these large scale data environments um, in production ready ways, it made that move from your laptop to your ultimate enterprise environment much, much easier. Tell us about those descriptions. The description of? Yeah, you were talking about those descriptions that allows that data scientist. Got it, yeah, absolutely. So um, in the early days of uh, Kubernetes, you would use something just like uh, uh, YAML just right. a raw description of uh, all the different applications that you want to deploy and roll out. And that's okay, 
Um, but that doesn't really take advantage of the fact that you are running in these different environments and your IT pros may want different settings for each of those environments. We then moved to a technology called Casenet, built by the Heptio folks, uh, or started by the Heptio folks, um, that allowed for templating. So same deal, you get this YAML, except you can say, oh, I'm running on a machine with one CPU or I'm running on a machine with eight CPUs very, very easily. And that was a good starting point and we, we loved that direction. Uh, now, uh, with Kubeflow 0.3, what we heard was that Casenet is good, but it's still really complicated. How do you make it simpler? How do you surface just the things that you want to change in each of these places. And we've launched a brand new tool called uh, KF Control, KF CTL. Um, and the idea there is with now just a single command like you would execute anything else, you're able to spin up an entire cluster that makes sense for your data science environment without ever having to touch those underlying descriptors of YAML or Casenet. You don't have to touch those underlying descriptors, which you had to do before. Exactly, which, you know, candidly speaking, data scientists are smart, but they don't want to think about this. They really want to think about their overall pipeline, their model, and the various components that they need to actually roll out uh, a new machine learning solution. So that gets into the setup then. Mm -hmm. And so the setup itself is going through what right now? What are some of those, what have been the traditional setups that you've used up to now um, to point three? And what are some of the things you want to improve upon? Yeah, I, I think that, that what we're really trying to figure out right now is the right layer of abstraction for a data scientist to be operating at, or a machine learning engineer. Data scientists, they understand all the elements of machine learning, right? They're going to think about what optimizer to use, the learning rate, the various hyperparameters that they want to tune, uh, you know, how many layers a particular model should have, that, and that they should be thinking about that. What they shouldn't be thinking about is what operating system might, is on my node? Uh, what are the drivers that I may need? Uh, oh, your, your YAML has the wrong um, uh, type of shutdown policy. I don't know, there's a million things that they don't need to think about. And you know, when we first got started, they still had to think about that. We made it much easier, made it easier to share between various folks, but they still had to think about it a little bit. You have to go in, you have to enter a bunch of you know, entries in order for you to get it right. Now, with these new tools that we've built, um, we're able to generate this on your behalf using a, a very simple command. Um, and it means that a data scientist now can very cleanly describe, oh, look, I don't care how you get there. Just give me a cluster with four nodes, each of which have four CPUs on them, and two GPUs, and this much disk, and this much this. Just go do that for me, and then I'm going to think about the things that really matter to me. Uh, and that's where we are right now. With our brand new tooling, um, data scientists can now operate at that level of abstraction while the machine learning engineers and the other folks in the enterprise can, can tweak the things under the hood with, uh, without affecting their workflow. So how are you starting to see them use it? How are you starting to see them use Kubeflow? Yeah, so <laughs> it is pretty funny because I always get on stage and I'm like, hey, slow down, this is 0 0.3 release. We still got time to go. Yet. Time and time again, I hear about folks using it in enormous deployments. Um, so just uh, uh, yesterday and tomorrow during the uh, keynote, I guess uh, yeah, that, yeah. that will already right. be passed, um, <clears throat> uh, SciCloud uh, will be talking about some of their enormous deployments that they're using with Kubeflow. So they're basically offering a PaaS for machine learning on, that runs on top of Kubeflow, and VIP.com, the number three e-commerce site in China, is using it for their machine learning workloads. And that's a perfect example where VIP doesn't have to think about anything under the hood. They could just have their data scientists think about how to build the best model, and SciCloud and Kubeflow together are able to provide a rich environment that can take those the requirements from VIP and roll it out. Just so I don't get things confused, SciCloud is spelled how? It's spelled C-A-I. Uh, okay, this is Sci the SciCloud then. We, we talked with them earlier. I want to make sure that I was talking about the right company. Yep. But they were talking a lot about how they are using how they are how their how their AI operating system is being used, for example, in you know utilities, and they're using computer vision technology with the hardware, using the infinite store capabilities that they may get from Ceph, for example, and then they then then they build the learning model according and then they label it, 
and then they then take that labeling and apply it then to the you know to the com the container technologies that are I guess deploying it across to then manage that kind of computer vision environment, so to speak. I'm mixing things up, as you can say. But there's a pipeline there, isn't there? Yeah, there absolutely is. And, and that's such a great example of what the complexity that Kubeflow, you know, we didn't get it on day one, but we have it now with the brand new 0 0.3 release. We announced Kubeflow pipelines. And the idea is that um, every machine learning workload today um, is is constructed of several steps as it gets trained. You're going to have a data ingestion step. You're going to have a data transformation step. Maybe you have a visualization or a statistics generation. You have a training step. Then you may want to validate the model that you trained and all these various things. These are the steps involved. Lots of folks think about you know just a single model and a single training as being machine learning, but that's really a small component of it. Exactly what SciCloud was talking about. You know, what they, they're able to do is they're able to provide different layers of abstraction. So you talked about infinite storage, right? They can just work on that with Ceph, surface that into Kubernetes, and then any application that's running in Kubernetes is going to be able to take advantage of that and build on top of that. No, declaratively. That that's the art. Declaratively, exactly right. And that's where Kubeflow sits. Kubeflow is not going to go out and redesign your storage system. It's not going to go out and redesign your drivers, your nodes, or anything like that. Are there, uh, has that been the history of platforms that you've seen? Yeah, absolutely. So more often than not, when you see platforms uh, you know, the, mo the most common machine learning platform is the one that was bespoke, hand done by a bunch of really smart people uh, in a single enterprise that couldn't work, you know, literally in the next building over because it's so specific to all the requirements of that enterprise. What we're trying to do with Kubeflow is say, hey, you know what? Kubernetes is the winner. It's everywhere, right? It's here, it's in the cloud, it's on-prem, it's on my laptop with Minikube or Docker. Kubernetes is it. If we assume that that's true, what can we do like one higher level up, where it's less bespoke, where you can use that declarative deployment and roll out an entire machine learning pipeline? That's where things really start to get more powerful because just like I'm trying to give data scientists the ability to not think about anything, I'm also trying to give the machine learning engineers the ones who are responsible for managing this thing in production, the ability to not think about anything. And they can hand it off to the IT pro folks who are responsible for deploying nodes or creating the Kubernetes clusters or whatever it might be. As, as you let each person focus on their particular layer and give them clean layers of abstraction between them, that's when you start getting real advancement in velocity. Those clean layers of abstraction, which translate to a developer experience. A exactly, so, so Kubernetes, for example, ha uh, introduced uh, several concepts over time, right? Um, you know, their, Kubernetes wasn't going out and reintroducing new storage technology. They were saying, oh, there's already Ceph or NFS or you know, raw block storage, maybe a cloud storage like S3 or Google Cloud Storage, you know, you name it. Um, they, Kubernetes said, okay, you know what? We're not going to try and reinvent that. We're going to create this layer called CSI, the Common Storage Interface. And as long as your thing has a provider that understands how to communicate to Kubernetes and say, hey, I'm a storage provider. If any pod wants to come along and grab some storage, here's how you talk to me. And it knows how to do that. So what that meant is, is that those developers, exactly like you said, those developers who wanted to build an application, they didn't have to understand, you know, whatever, S3's APIs or NFS's APIs or anything like that. They're just like, hey, Kubernetes, go get me 10 gigabytes. And because of that storage interface, Kubernetes could say, oh, hey, I have something here that's a plugin that understands how to make, fulfill the request, give me 10 gigabytes. And then Kubernetes goes and does that, the plugin goes and does that under the hood, it does a bunch of work, gives you the 10 gigabytes, hands that all the way back to the pod. So what are the trade-offs then going from bespoke to this type of, uh, of you know, new approach? You know, I, I, that's a really interesting question because um, most of the time, the bespoke actually works okay. People spent a lot of time tweaking it and making sure that it runs great in your environment. What you're going to have is you're going to have some amount of change. You're going to have to adopt this new framework, this new tooling, whatever it might be. Um, you're going to have to adapt your old you know, techniques, your common logging, your monitoring, whatever it might be, to watch this platform, 
make sure it works properly, make sure it's, um, uh, you know, obeys your enterprise requirements. That's, that's time and energy. And a lot of times you're gonna see, you know, almost no gain on day one, right? You're gonna uh, have this bespoke thing that works pretty well, and then you're gonna do a bunch of work, and you're just gonna get back to where you started from. You're like, well, why did I do a lot of work? Because the moment that you need to go to a new environment, let's say you wanna go multi-cloud, and you're like, well, you know, uh, uh, Google's doing fine, but I'd like to add Azure to my mix. So what, what, I, what do I do? Well, in the old days, you would have to take your bespoke environment and write a completely new bespoke environment for the Azure right. uh, or the on-prem. Now, because you've adopted this, it's Kubernetes, Kubernetes runs on AKS, Kubernetes runs on GKE, you're able to spread across both of them and move very, very quickly from one to another. But people keep their data usually in one place. So data is a good, good point, but that doesn't mean that you're only going to do training in a single place, right? Um, it's very common that you'll want to take advantage of the different things that different clouds provide. Uh, you know, maybe you have some data in Redshift, maybe you have some data in Spanner, maybe you have some data in Cosmo DB, maybe it's on the local disk, who knows? It, it doesn't matter. What the, you're doing is you're picking and choosing the tools and technologies that make sense for that particular scenario. And to, for far too long, um, all those scenarios would get kind of get squeezed into a you know round peg square hole. You're like, well, we're all in on Amazon. So you know, even though Redshift isn't as good as whatever cloud SQL from Google, we're going to use it because that was our only choice or whatever. I, I, I don't want to throw anyone under the bus. Just assume that's the case. Um, in this case, now you can pick and choose. Maybe your you know edge. IOT processor runs better on Azure, and maybe your um, whatever, your you know e-commerce fraud detection runs better on AWS, great, go to town. You can now pick and choose, but you don't have to rewrite your entire bespoke solution in order to get that to work. You send the data where it makes sense, and then off you go. So it's not about much of the data portability as it is about the application framework portability that you can use and to call the data? I mean, because like, if your data is going to be on a disk, if your data is going to be on a, in, in multiple cloud services, yeah. and you're trying to find the, the commonality to bring that together, yeah. that... So, no, you, you know, uh, let me be real clear. We are absolutely not solving the data portability issue. That's always going to be uh, a situation. You're going to want data in wherever it makes sense to you. Maybe you have different regions. Maybe you want it in different regions for um, uh, legal reasons. Maybe you want it for performance reasons. There's all sorts of reasons that you're going to want data in different locations. Uh, what this really provides is it means you're a data scientist and your ML engineers can go to any place that you have deployed this application and, ha and the same tooling works and the same techniques I work see. in all these various places. Right. Data is going to be data. There's, you know, the speed of light is there for a reason. You basically can't, you know, you know, move data faster than, you know, where, where we're moving it today. It's, it's as fast as you're going to go. Um, and you really don't want to deal with uh, things where it's like replicating across multiple clouds for any other purpose than just backup and reliability and things like that. Um, uh, what you really want to do is take advantage for your particular scenario, take advantage of the cloud that makes sense for you um, and where your data is. You've already chosen to put your data. So what are the gaps in the pipelines now? So the biggest thing is, you know, I, I, I'm a huge fan of, of thinking about ethical AI and ethical ML. Um, and I think that's, that's an area where I would like to see a lot more innovation, whether or not it's teasing apart your ML model to look for uh, areas of un unexpected bias, uh, looking for areas of, um, uh, you know, particular vulnerabilities, security vulnerabilities and things like that. I, I would love to see, as we get closer to production and 1.0, um, a real investment from the major players in the ML space, Microsoft, Google, Amazon, um, where they are releasing tools to go that and detect these very common issues um, and, and plug them into pipelines like Kubeflow. Um, there's also certainly a lot of uh, stability and, and other things that we're going to need to get to as we get to 1.0. Again, I, I don't want to overpromise. This is a 0 0.3 release. We probably got you know at least another six months before we're 1.0 because we want to make sure that it's you know production quality, Kubernetes quality. Um, we're, we're quickly advancing towards there, but it's going to take some time, and we'll have to make some investments there. 
Um, but by and large, what investments know, are you looking at? Well, you know, it, it's like I was saying earlier. Um, IAM, RBAC, uh, upgrades. We want to make that very clean. Um, there's a lot of things like that, and and most of all, it's. Uh, stability of the APIs. And I don't mean that you're going to run this thing and it's going to crash. No, actually the opposite is true. It relies on Kubernetes, relies on things like TensorFlow and PyTorch. These are all production ready frameworks. So they're ready to go. What I mean by stability of the APIs is, you know, tomorrow we could have a phenomenal engineer from wherever, JD.com, come in and say, oh, you know, this API looks great, but I'd really like to add the following field because it'll improve efficiency by 31%. If we're at 1.0 and the API is quote unquote stable, then you're going to want to do that very slowly. Uh, so the stable API is really the goal. Oh yeah, absolutely. Always. Uh, always going to be the goal. But stable means um, you have a really well-defined long-term process for any significant changes. Because you don't want to like make a massive change and break every existing deployment. You want to say, this is, you know, uh, uh, we're committed to supporting this for three full releases or whatever it might be, whatever the, the governance and the team comes together with. And that's what we really want to uh, nail down as part of our 1.0 release. So, what are the intersections with application architectures? You know, because we're talking a lot about data architectures to yeah. some extent. And in application architectures, you know, one of the um, developments we've seen over the past year is this interest in much more declarative environments mm -hmm. such as serverless technologies. Yeah. And serverless for us is a kind of a broader term. Functions is more of the kind of when you get more into the into the kind of the more of the details, right? Yeah. What is the intersection of serverless technologies and in and, and these new types of frameworks like like Kuplo? Yeah, so I think that's a really interesting question. Um, uh, and, and the funny part is, is we're really kind of touching on all of the things with Kubeflow. So Kubeflow is designed in its core to not require, to, to be this microservice oriented, very loosely coupled system. So I talked about this pipeline. Uh, let's say you have a, I don't know, a four step pipeline. Step one is I'm going to ingest some data. Step two is I'm going to train on it. Step three is I'm going to take my trained model and package it in a particularly interesting way, uh, or something that's appropriate. Step four, I'm going to roll it out to production, right? Uh, and maybe hand it to my Edge IoT device. Okay, that's a really straightforward, very common pipeline. Well, you know, while many architectures would require running all those in a single cluster, Kubeflow is designed to do actually exactly the opposite. That first step for your data ingestion step, maybe you're using an existing Spark cluster that outputs to whatever, a, a standard NFS bucket. Second one, maybe you want to use the TF training job that exists right there in your cluster, uh, and you, know, you want to spin that up and spin that down. Step three, maybe for that packaging step, you use something like Google Cloud Builder, which has uh, security scanning and other things built in, because look, I don't, I don't see any value in me building my own builder, and they got a whole bunch of scanning stuff, and step four, maybe I want to use, I don't know, uh, Azure you know, IoT service to roll it out to IoTs, right? Now I've pieced together four different components from very, very different things, but they're all part of a single application. I think that's what you're seeing more and more of today, where it's rather than me having to build a monolith that where I have to be the best at every one of those steps, I can pick and choose what makes sense to me and wire them together using something like Kubeflow Pipelines that understands how to communicate, not just within a cluster, but even externally to the cluster back and forth. Um, I think you will continue to see those, and you'll see them in more and more sophisticated ways. So, for example, the Knative project um, on uh, Kubernetes uses uh, very sophisticated extensions to the Kubernetes masters called uh, custom resource definitions. Uh, and those things really make it very powerful um, to use the Kubernetes native APIs and still communicate with these ex external things. And that's exactly what we do with Kubeflow and Kubeflow pipelines. One of the big questions that comes up now, I think increasingly, is uh, the role of open source, clearly. So open source software is at the center of business, as we well know, and open source is increasingly um, built into the software. I mean, software is increasingly open source, right? And you know, and one of the things we talk a lot about is this is community. But how do you avoid the community of one? You know, like, you know, uh, how, how, do you, how do you temper that? I mean, 
Kuplo is a project that came out of Google, mm -hmm. right? It's a, uh, um, and Google, you know, is on the, on the leading edge of a lot of open source projects. You know, l other large companies are on the, are on the leading edge of open source projects. How do you, how do you, you know, how do you think about, you know, those dueling forces? Yeah. So, you know, uh, companies are not charities, right? They're not just going to launch an open source project for no reason. Um, they're doing it because they see a way that the world looks better if it, if it, um, uh, you know, if people adopt this and people adopt these standards. And to be clear, uh, a lot of time they're releasing it because they don't want the world, they see the world maybe going in a bad direction where you have a bespoke solution or you have an ML solution that only works on one cloud or something like that, and that's terrible, right? Like that would hurt everyone. It helps one person, the people who build that, you know, bespoke single cloud solution, and it hurts everyone else. It slows the industry, slows those kind of things. So how do you solve those? The, the key is to find other people who have the same problem you do. So with Kubernetes, Google's goal was, hey, we love that people are adopting Kubernetes, but we want to make it more useful. You know, uh, I, I joked about this when I was leading Kubernetes, you know, uh, I would hear all the time from customers, great, I have a container orchestration system, now what do I do with it? And the problem is, is that that's a great question. You know, for a lot of people, you're like, well, I already had an application server. You know, I, that, that's great. Um, with things like uh, Kubeflow, with things like Kubernetes, our goal is not just to have this brand new technology, but actually make it useful, to make it a positive business impact. And if uh, customers, if other companies can see value in the framework that you have built, in the technology and the application you have built, and see more value in contributing to yours versus going and building their own, um, then they're going to come and contribute. And that's a scary thing for them. And, and part of the key that we've tried to do with Kubernetes and with Kubeflow is to make sure that they, they understood that through governance models and through techniques of that sort where, where you can have multiple people on technical oversight committees, um, that really makes a difference in making sure that they're not scared, that they're not you know, building on something that ultimately someone else can pull out the rug from underneath them. And so that's incredibly important to like get the other side of that. Okay, so then just playing devil's advocate sure. a little bit more, um, you know, I'm a, a large company comes forward with a project, it becomes extremely popular, yeah, and they don't see the upside of it necessarily, right? And they say, I'm not going to do this again. You know, I, we can just do this internally. What's yeah. the that? What's the danger in that? Um, well, the danger is, uh, and you know, I, I, I certainly won't throw anyone under the bus, but the danger is uh, you have seen it happen where companies released open source things with crazy licenses or restrictive communities or, uh, you know, somehow didn't accept external contributions. Maybe they kind of did, but like, oh yeah. Or made you, it so complicated that it. Exactly. Um, that will hurt your adoption. And ultimately, it will simply encourage a competitive solution that- um, Is uh, open source. That is open source in the right way. And I, you know, I'm, I'm seeing it happen right now, time and again, um, where someone says, oh yeah, this is completely open source. Look, look here it is. And, and then for whatever reason, um, you know, they're, they're the only ones who can contribute to it and they lock it down and then all of a sudden somebody else comes out and the other one thing that's more open source gathers the community that you were just talking about and gathers the coalition of people that are like, we do like that one better, but it's less open. We don't see ourselves in it versus this one where we actually do see ourselves in it and, and they're able to move forward. Now, but to be clear, that doesn't always work either, right? A lot of these coalitions end up being vendor driven or other things like that. That's not good either. You still need strong guidance. You still need strong architecture. Um, but if you don't think about your community, you don't think about ways for people not to be afraid to see themselves in it, um, they're gonna, you know, you, you know, um, uh, go a different way. So these open source projects need protection, so to speak, to actually be able to assure that they'll be there as well. Yeah. How's Kubeflow going to do that? Well, so Kubeflow is licensed under Apache 2. So uh, if Google decided tomorrow that, um, you know, this is a terrible idea, I can't believe we ever did this, 
uh, project's open. So someone else could fork it instantly. Uh, I think, if I'm not mistaken, the Kubeflow name is technically trademarked. So you'd have to come up with a new name. Uh, not the end of the world. Uh, and I'm sure if you ask Google nicely, they'd probably say, fine, here, have it, because we're <laughs> abandoning it. No, to be clear, extremely clear, nobody at Kubeflow is thinking of abandoning Kubeflow. It's a great project. Yeah. Um, uh, so that's a very important point, And that's why those core licenses are so important. Now, that said, um, because of the nature of the governance model, that's why it's so important. It's, uh, the license is half of it, but the governance is the other half of it. And, and if you don't nail down a strong governance model, um, so that if a single player walks away, the community just doesn't fall apart, um, that's going to be a problem. David, thank you so much for taking some time to talk with us. I'm with David Aranchik, who is the co-founder of Kubeflow, an interesting project and speaks to kind of the, the continued evolution of container technologies and the impact that they're having, but also this need for really at scale machine learning environments. So really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. It's always a pleasure. Thanks, David. Bye-bye. This episode of the New Stack Makers is sponsored by KubaCon plus CloudNativeCon. KubaCon plus CloudNativeCon conferences gather adopters and technologists to further the education and advancement of cloud native computing. The vendor neutral events feature domain experts and key maintainers behind popular projects such as Kubernetes, Prometheus, gRPC, Envoy, and more. The KubaCon Seattle event is coming right up December 10th through 13th. It is sold out. You can still get on the waiting list. Registration will open soon for their 2019 events. Be sure to register early for KubaCon Barcelona, May 20th through 23rd. KubaCon Shanghai, June 24th through 26th. And KubaCon San Diego, November 18th through 21. Hope to see you there. Listen to more episodes of the New Stack Makers at thenewstack.io slash podcasts. Please rate and review us on iTunes, like us on YouTube, and follow us on SoundCloud. Thanks for listening, and see you next time.